Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, guys, thank you for joining us today. This is being recorded. One thing I say at the beginning of every single one of my webinars is watch this again relatively soon after. Uh, it will make some of these nuances really stick into your long-term memory. So uh, if you wait a week or you know a month down the road, it's going to be like learning it all over again. So take advantage of that. We'll be sending this out and watch it again because, like I said, it will make a little bit more sense to you. Uh, let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. My name is Eric Wilkinson. Some of you guys may recognize me as the Wolfman from CNBC, Fox Business, or even the Wall Street Journal. I've basically been trading my own money since college. I uh, started out tra uh, trading with a psychology degree and decided to switch it over to finance. Moved to Chicago and have been trading um, ever since the early 90s. So uh, in that time, I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodity futures, and currencies and options in all these products, basically in all market conditions. And I've gone from trading in the pits to trading on the screen and now trading from a desk for the most part, but just like everybody else online. Um, any opinions, news, research and analysis or other information uh, provided by ProTrader Strategies and associated companies or employees is provided as general commentary and does not constitute investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities or strategies. At the end of the day, you guys, I don't know your risk parameters. I don't know what's in your portfolios. And therefore, what I'm doing could be counterintuitive to what you guys are already doing. Uh, we're here to teach you guys how to swim. I'm not going to be one of those people that like throws out to everybody, hey, you need to put this in your portfolio because that doesn't make sense. You might already have it in your portfolio. You might have a different directional assumption or something along those lines. Basically, what we want to do is uh, teach you these tools so that you can go out there and implement them in your own way. Please remember the past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. And you guys can follow me on Twitter at Wolfman's blog and especially follow me now because we're getting ready to head into earnings season. Uh, and I'll be tweeting out what I'm kind of doing in those. I'll tell you what directional bias I have basically, but you guys will know from uh, all of these webinars what strike location. And you can follow Pro Trader Strap for all kinds of good trader wisdom. All right, now this particular one is going to be on the short call spread, you guys. So what we're trying to do here is we started out with beginner, give you guys a little bit of base as to you know options and things of that nature. Now we're starting to get a little bit more advanced. Now with a short call spread, it is a relatively easy strategy to understand, but it does have uh, a higher risk tolerance uh, parameters that you're gonna need to make sure uh, we have as appropriate for each one of us, okay? Uh, the short call spread is is great because it's defined risk. So if you've gone from being a person that likes to buy options, kind of getting your feet wet that way, this is a great one because now we're starting to get into um, defined risk strategies so you know your risk parameter, your uh, risk uh total risk outlay, I guess, uh, for lack of a better phrase. <laughs> but this will kind of start getting people used to collecting premium. Now, the short call spread has a lower probability of success than, let's say, a naked short call, but we do know our risk. So that is the beauty in the short call spread going forward. And with this, we need a bearish to market neutral assumption. Now, it's fine. It's kind of hard to find a bearish assumption these days, it seems like, because a rising tide lifts all ships, which is what we're seeing across the board. Even crummy stocks are, are rallying. And uh, that being said, as long as the market moves sideways, this is still something that we can make money on. Whereas if we had a long put or something along those lines, a market neutral assumption with a long put and a you know bearish assumption, but a market neutral is not good for a long put because of that theta decay. Whereas if the market just moves sideways, uh, we're good with the short call spread. We can still make money. All right, so let's go over the essentials to success. Uh, Tesla could be bearish. It, listen, I'm bearish Tesla out the yin yang, but 
it still seems to want to go up. People don't people don't look at uh, earnings the way they used to. All right, so the essentials to success is picked in the right underlying. One of the things I always say with this particular uh, bullet is that when we're looking at picking the right stock, that doesn't necessarily mean we're picking the right directional assumption. Picking the right stock in this case means there's all kinds of stocks out there. You know, there's thousands of stocks out there, but not all of them have a lot of participation in the options. So what we want to do when we go to look at the option montage is, you know, the closest expiration cycle inside of 35 days is pretty good. But what we want to look to make sure is that the bid to the ask is inside of 10 cents wide for any stock under $100. Cisco just happens to be the one that I had up and it is under $100. So the bid to the ask on the calls and the puts closest to the at the money should be, uh, you know, closest to at the money, but just out of the money should be 10 cents wide. All right. Any stock that's over $100, uh, say, for instance, like a Facebook or something like that being over $100. What we generally will do here as a rule of thumb is move the decimal three ticks to the left. And it should be about 18 cents wide from the bid to the ask. And uh, you can see that Facebook fits that parameter. It's about 15 cents wide here. Uh, and usually it will be a little bit tighter too. You can see anytime you get tighter bid to ask, you'll have a lot of volume and open interest, which Facebook has. And that creates those tighter markets. If you look at something like Aon, the Aon has... Uh, a lot less participation in the uh, contracts, as you can see here, 16 contracts traded total today, and it's about 20 cents wide to the bid ask. Well, our rule of thumb would have said this should be at least 13, 14 cents wide, and we don't get that. Even though everybody's heard of AR, they don't like to trade their options. So let's stay away from that because we have to give up too much edge to get in and too much edge to get out. And that's going to eat away at our yield when we have something like that. Because when you want to get out, you're, you're looking for these people that have the open interest to help you out. And that's not going to happen uh, here as opposed to uh, something with uh, Facebook where it's you know relatively closely priced. Uh, we have much tighter markets in there. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, this part should uh, this. This wonderful short call spread just cost me $500 this week when the stock price blew through my long strike. Well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the probabilities beat us on this one. And, you know, with the market going parabolic this month, believe me, I've, I've had short call spreads and short calls that are getting blown through on the upside too. Uh, it is definitely right now um, kind of, beating the probabilities, the market beating the probabilities to the upside. You know, a lot of it has to do with the, you know, the euphoria around the tax cuts that a lot of people are saying that, you know, it, and, and it's true that these bottom lines and what we thought that these guys were going to be making is actually going to be better, right? Because now the tax cuts, that's uh, would normally eat at their um, profitability, and now their profitabilities are kind of increasing. So that's also helping these stocks. So uh, right now, is a, I'll agree, uh, it is a difficult uh, short for on the call side or, you know, um, calling a top on this market. It's not working out very well for in, any short deltas for the most part. All right. Um, and then the next picking the right strike with this, we're going to start at about a half a standard deviation move or a 36 Delta. I don't have the chart on the standard deviation right now, but uh, naked calls. We usually look to go at about a 16 Delta, which is a one standard deviation move. Well, with the call spread, we actually have to increase our risk in a sense because we got to get closer to the market to collect enough premium to make it worth our while. All right, so picking the right strikes, we start out with a 36 delta, and we want this to be somewhere between, we want to collect around a third to 25% the width of the strikes. Uh, that being said, it makes the risk reward worth it. Um, you know, if you're only collecting a couple of nickels, uh, by the time the 
commissions and everything else happen and the width of the spread uh, supersedes the amount that you're going to be able to get by, you know, X amount that doesn't really make it worth it. If your reward is 10 cents to lose 90 cents, to me, that's not worth the risk reward. And duration, anytime we're doing short call spreads or collecting a credit, we want time to be on our side. So we want theta decay to come happen. And theta is the thief in the night that comes and steals your premium. Well, when you're short premium, you want that thief to have an open door straight to your uh, decay. And that's what we're looking at here. Somewhere in between five, 45 to 35 days is where I like to really start implementing this strategy so we can take advantage of this theta decay that happens. It starts picking up rapidly and then, you know, even more so in the last seven days. I would like to be out well before that. I even like to be out somewhere, you know, between 14 and seven days, if at all possible. The reason why, uh, if this strategy hasn't decayed that much, when you get inside this seven days, you're really becoming, you have a gamma uh, aspect that starts really juking around with your premiums and it makes it, makes it difficult on timing to get out. So uh, one day you could be at 50% of your max profit and then next day it's all gone because of that gamma increase in your premium. So try and stay away from that. I'd like to be out relatively soon on this strategy. I'd like to be out of all my strategies as quickly as possible, to be quite honest. Uh, anyway, picking the right environment with Premium selling strategies, we want high implied volatility percent. So something greater than 50 uh, in ETFs because it's a basket of goods and those volatilities kind of um, level each other out or uh, average each other out a little bit more. It's hard to get spikes in ETFs. It's not to say that it doesn't happen. Uh, we are seeing some ETFs up in the 70s right now that we can take a look at because those premiums are really juicy. So that's when you want to take advantage of it is when volatility is really high, premiums are at you know the greatest that you're going to see in quite some time. And when volatility reverts back to the mean, then that's when uh, we want to see that, or that's when we are going to see that theta decay. Uh, because when premiums start getting jacked up, say for instance, with Facebook, they have earnings coming out relatively soon. But as you can see, as volatility jacks up, it has a tendency to really come out rather quickly. So it, it ratchets up slowly, but then comes out rather quickly. And we want to take advantage of some of that move of the premiums coming out rather quickly. So kind of what happens is volatility acts like a balloon sometimes, and volatility will expand in it you know, synthetically holds off theta decay. So as, you know, you start getting into this, if you start seeing volatility pump up, it pushes up this curve a little bit. But then when that volatility comes out, the, it expediates the premium decay to catch up. So that's what we're looking for is when volatility is pushing up on the premiums, we get those juicier premiums, all right? It allows us to be, uh, increase our probabilities of being right. Because the further out we can get, the higher probability of success we have, right? If we have a much greater move and when that volatility comes out, those premiums decay rapidly, all right? So we want to take advantage of that, all right? And then knowing our exit strategy before entering the trade, with this strategy, uh, we want to take about 50% of our max profit. Now, depending on how much you guys pay in commissions, and uh, I've gone back and forth with quite a few of you guys on emails and some of you guys are paying a lot more in premiums than what I expected. So for that, uh, one thing to keep in mind is keep track of how much commissions you guys are paying over the course of a year. And, you know, it's like the cable company when they jack up your rates, you go back to them and say, hey, listen, I'm going to switch to DirecTV if you guys don't lower my rates to what you guys were offering the new people. And they're going to make uh, that adjustment for you. And the same goes for your trading platform. If you start seeing your premiums go up or you've been pay paying high premiums for a long period of time, add up how much you guys have paid in commissions to these guys and just reach out to them and say, hey, you guys, I've paid a lot in commissions. 
Is there any way you guys can lower my commission structure? Uh, and they will most likely do that so that they don't lose your business, just like the cable company doesn't want to lose your business. These guys tout how much assets under management they have to increase all kinds of things, spending, uh, you know, uh, budgets, hiring, all of that stuff is a vanity metric that they want and your assets attribute to that. So go back to them, just say, hey, you know, I'd like to lower my commissions. I paid this much over the course. I'm a, you know, long-term customer. I love your platform. Can you lower it for me? And most likely they will. But having said that, knowing your exit strategy before entering the trade, I like to go about 50% of my max profit. If you guys are paying a lot in commissions, you know, you were gonna probably have to go to maybe 70% of max profit before exiting that trade just to make it worthwhile. Um, but look, at the end of the day, remember this curve. We don't wanna get back into this area here with this trade on necessarily. Um, unless, you know, it, it's a winner, but, um, I would try and stay away from that and, and take whatever profit you can, um, he getting in before that area. So I like to go at about 50% of my max profit, but if you're paying really high fees, you might need to stretch that out to about 70% of max profit before exiting that trade. And I was practicing around with that or playing around with that at the end of last year, squeezing out a little bit more, uh, checking out my probabilities and things of that nature. And they didn't change that much. I only had to have them on for an extra couple of days. Uh, so that was probably worth the risk. And a lot of people are going to need to do that. All right. So our max profit on a short call spread. Anytime we're collecting a premium, what is it? Yes. Our max profit is the premium we collected obviously minus commissions pay. Uh, but anytime you're doing that, collecting a credit, that is your max profit. We are going to go 50% of whatever that max profit is or 70% of that max profit. But our max loss is basically the width of the spread minus that premium we receive. So if we're looking at taking a third the width of the strikes, right? So 30, let's just call it 30 cents on a dollar wide, our max profit is 30 cents. Our max loss is 70 cents because it's that width of the strikes, which is a dollar minus that premium we re we received. And minus, minus the commissions paid, but I don't know what everybody's commissions are, so I can't really add, the, or sorry, plus the commissions, but I can't ever really keep track of everybody's commissions. And then our break even point is the short call strike plus that premium we received, okay? And the reason why is because when you're collecting a credit, that increases your break even because that credit is yours. So if I sold the 50 calls or the 50, <clears throat> 51 call spread, collected 30 cents, my break even at expiration, and all of these are at expiration, you guys. It's not taking into account that early exit that we're talking about, but our Break even at expiration is the 50 strike plus that 30 cents. So when the underlying is trading at $50 and 30 cents. Now, if it happens right away, like Farshid was talking about, it happens right away and it goes through your, blows through your short calls. It's going to feel like it's a little bit more um, than that. or the, the break even is a little bit lower than that $50, but this is assuming at expiration. I can't do every single day on the timeline to figure out our break evens. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of stocks that you guys want to look at. I think uh, somebody already threw one out. I think it was HH throughout um, Tesla. Tesla, um, oops, Tesla it could be a bearish move. You know, that they don't seem to make any money, so how are they still in business? Uh, it's from all the government breaks that they get for the most part but we could look at this as a short it's got look, looks like it's got pretty high implied volatility one thing we don't want to do you guys with this strategy is put this on you know right before an earnings so if they had earnings coming up in this cycle we wouldn't necessarily want to put that on right now because what we can look at from past uh moves is 
volatility increases going into those. So if we were to do it at around the same time as last uh, cycle, you can see it was trading, the volatility was here, but then it increased going into that. We don't want volatility to necessarily increase. We don't want volatility to really increase because the market could be going down and as volatility starts spiking like this, we can be directionally right, but not make money because those premiums are getting pumped up like I showed in that chart earlier. We would rather have implied volatility go down. So what we want to start out with is really high implied volatility and take advantage of something like when we see the volatility coming out here. Uh, you know, obviously it's easy to know when volatility comes out when there's an earnings, but there's also other times when it's really high and not necessarily around earnings. That's when we want to take advantage of it. I'm assuming Tesla has earnings coming out, but for an example, you know, we could, we're going to probably need to use some examples over here where we have high implied volatility that has earnings just as an example for the setup, because when you have really low implied volatility, it's really hard to set up this strategy correctly. Uh, you just won't be able to get the third to width, third to 25 percent the width of the strikes um, when we're setting this up. So one thing we can look at as a cheat for implied volatility percent is right here. It's got 37 ID percent. Sometimes we'll have something like Priceline uh, where it's not giving me the ID percent, right? Uh, it's going to show it here, 47. But if you ever have a platform that doesn't show ID percent or need to figure it out yourself, basically the mathematical equation is in the numerator and the denominator. In the numerator, we have where the current implied volatility is, which is 17 minus the low, which is down here around one or two. So 17 minus two is 15. And then divide that by the sum of the high, which is 34 minus the low of, of two, which gives us, uh, what did I say? 15 divided by 32. So it's j just right below 50%. So right around 47%, all right? So that's not gonna really fit our bill. We want something with pretty high implied volatility. So uh, UAA is another one, Under, Under Armour, uh, trading around 15. I thought our Under Armour was UA. Is an Under Armour UA, no? Huh. Is it UAA now? Did they change something? Is this a different? Oh, these are class A shares, aren't they? All right. Well, we can try and look at it. I don't know what their options look like under here, though. Um, so we can take a look at it. It looks like they have pretty tight markets as well. $15 stock. It's close, but we can take a look at it if we're bearish. You know, that this is another reason why we need to know this particular fraction, right? And how to figure out ID percent is because sometimes you have these massive spikes like Under Armour felt that was around in earnings and was probably a pretty, um, you know, pretty uh, scary moment for them anyway. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people probably putting on protection, but we got, sometimes you will see these spikes that are out of the blue. So I have a tendency to discount major spikes out of the blue. We're starting to come into another earnings cycle, so we're getting another spike there. But I would say that this is a pretty high implied volatility for Under Armour right now. And, it, you know, one could, if we discounted this one, say that it's at 100 um, percent. Because when you take the math and where it currently is minus the low and then the high minus the low, that's going to be at 100 percent. So I would say that, you know, Under Armour might fit that bill if we didn't have the earnings coming in right there. Uh, I have a feeling they probably do as well as as this next option cycle is having a lot of earnings. And it's very difficult to find something that's outside of that. As you can see here, it is falling inside of there. Uh, it's UAA we have for the Class A shares, um, but their earnings are still the same day. Um, so uh, we can can we all agree to assume that we may 
the past, the fact that there's earnings in there, just to get us the idea of the high implied volatility percent. Uh, we'll pretend there's no earnings coming up in a sense to give us a better example to see how this works out. Um, so what I said was we kind of look for that 36 delta. You're not always going to be able to get that. Uh, so with that being said, we would probably start here and go with uh, the ones that are just out of the money. So selling those Under Armour to buy those, we get 25 cents. That's a little bit less than what we want to be able to do. And that's because of the uh, – Delta's being 27 versus, you know, 10 difference in Delta uh, is not going to allow us to do this. So at the end of the day, what I would look at is a completely different strategy for this. Uh, I would look for something else to short Under Armour in, uh, for this. If I had a bearish assumption, it wouldn't really fit my rules with that because 25 cents for a two dollar and 50 cent wide uh, spread is, you know, Basically, we're looking at about a sixth, less than a sixth the width of the spread. So that one's not really going to work out for us. So I would look for something else to use to short uh, Under Armour. And a lot of times when you have these really low priced stocks, it makes it much more difficult to get that third the width of the strike. So um, having said that, Throw them out there in the questions box and I'll go over them as soon as I see them. If you guys have any uh, ideas on on them, uh, somebody wants me to throw out Costco. Uh, Costco, you know, um, you know, I, I guess I could give a bullish assumption for just about anything right now. Costco had a big move uh, last couple of days. Nice move to the upside after feeling some downward pressure. This move is basically because. Walmart came out and said they're going to be closing their Sam's Clubs, which is one of the biggest competitors to uh, Costco. So that's good for Costco, right? Uh, Costco has pretty decent implied volatility. Uh, let's we can check just give us a check on uh, what their earnings looks like, see if it falls in that area. So we actually have a full clean month for their earnings. So that that works for that. Um, that works there. Uh, we would probably want to be above 195 or at least at 195 for this. So let's look at here. So 39 Delta is closest to the 36 Delta. So that works. So we're going to sell this. It's a $5 wide. So on a $5 wide, we probably want to be able to collect at least a dollar 60 to dollar 25, I think is uh, $5 wide. Uh, so dollar twenty five would be about a quarter. Dollar uh, sixty six would be closer to thirty three percent. So it's right falling right in line with that. So that would fit the rule. Uh, one thing I forgot to check: does it fit the rule of being about twenty cents wide? It fits that rule. I mean sixty fifty nine to uh, seventy nine. That's twenty cents wide. You know we're off by a penny there. Uh, but for the most part, you can see. Uh, it's inside of 20 cents wide. So that makes it fit our rule on that move the decimal three ticks to the left to be a stock that is, um, you know, picking the right underlying, if you will. All right. So that fits this rule. We got $5 wide, $1.74. There's another little trick on probability of success with this strategy. What you can do is um, you can really only do it with the call and put spreads for the most part. But uh, what you do is you take what you're risking. So we're, our reward is $1.47. Let's just call it $1.50 just for math purposes, okay? Just make this math easy. So $1.50 is our risk or our, is our reward. Our risk on a $5 wide then is what? Well, total is in $5. That's our total risk, right? But we get to keep this collection. So our actual risk, our max loss, if you will, is what we take here is $3.50. So if you take $3.50 and divide that by $5, which is the total width, we come up with a 70% probability of success, which is pretty close um, for this strategy. You know, it's pretty close to what the delta is going to be for the most part. Um, so 70, 
70% <clears throat> on that. As a matter of fact, our probabilities of success are slightly better than that because we were at $1.47. So that fits the rule uh, between the third to 25% collection. Um, you know, the less you collect, the more your probability of success is going to be with this, the more you're risking, the higher your probability of success is. So uh, keep that in mind. For instance, if we were, you know, only going to be able to collect $1.25, then, you know, doing that risk reward, the delta on this is going to be a little bit lower, though, in that example, if we were to go lower. But just to show you, when we did $1.50, if we did $1.25, uh, that would be three dollars and 75 cents then right that would be our total risk divided by the five dollars would give us a 75 percent probability of success so um you know that also would be getting further away from where the underlying is trading as well because you're going to collect less right um can you show for the stocks that have id percent and don't have an earnings event uh for the next 30 days to find the suitable stock well farshid uh Jack, thank you, Jack, for giving us Costco, because that does. That fits all those rules. It has high implied volatility percent. It doesn't have an earnings. Uh, and we are able to collect the width of the strike. So this one actually fits the rules. And it fits the rules on the picking the right underlying, picking the right strikes. We got a 36 delta. Well, we don't necessarily have a 36 delta, but we're as close as we can get to that. You're, you know, the, you're going to be hard pressed to find an exact 36 delta that's just our starting point on picking the right strikes so we start out with like a 36 delta because that's the reason why that's the rule of thumb because that's about where you have the best chances of getting that third the width of the strikes the right duration 35 days to expiration that fits that rule um and then the right environment being high implied volatility um which is above 50, so it just met, meets that one. What about the out of the money probability? Is that needed here also? Uh, the probability of being out of the money, yeah, that is. I mean, it's a 60% probability of being out of the money at expiration by at least one penny. But, um, you know, our probabilities are going to increase here, you guys, because when we're collecting this dollar forty, and I'm looking at getting about a third to, uh, or 50%, uh, sorry, 50% of max profit. We talked about that being at around $1.47, $1.50. We're going to be getting out at around 75 cents. So if we get any type of down move whatsoever, or volatility coming out at all, we are going to be able to achieve that rather, rather quickly, okay? And then we've beaten the probabilities. That's going to increase our probabilities dramatically. And I would say that on like a call spread where probabilities of success here are about 70. It's going to be probably somewhere slightly higher than just 80%, okay? Because if you take into account a 50, 50 probability of it going up or down in a sense, well, that 50% probability of it going down increases our chances quite dramatically when we have a 70% probability of success strategy, okay? So that down move will get us to that um, 50% of max profit, and if we can get out early, then we've increased our probabilities dramatically, and that's what we want to do. You know, that probability on the 70% where I did it on the calculator, oops, on the uh, calculator, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that is also at expiration. So um, it's very difficult to come up with different probabilities inside of um early ex or early exits you know i mean everything's like black shoals even doesn't take into account early exits because uh that's one of its major flaws uh you always struggle with uh probabilities of out of the money and the premium received well these are the probabilities of being out of the money at expiration okay um but one of the difficult things is when you're selling one delta to buy another delta, you know, that, that's going to differentiate a little bit. So, um, you know, one of the things you can look at of the probabilities of success are, you know, uh, you know, subtracting the delta from one another, coming up with about a, you know, 17 
total negative deltas, which is, you know, close to that 75 uh, percent probability, or actually it's closer to 85 percent probability of success, but that doesn't really work. Um, some people throw that out there. That's not really the right way to do it necessarily. You can look at it where it's about a, you know, 60 percent probability of this being in the money, but when you take into account a defined risk strategies, you have a higher probability of success in that when the market moves up against us, this premium is also going to inflate for us. So it's going to help us if we are directionally wrong, um, the one that we bought. So that helps change those probabilities of success a little bit too. So, you know, there's a lot of levers and pulleys. The easiest way to do this on a spread is to take the premium received and um, or actually what your risk is. You know, you know what your premium received is, is $1.50. So what's our risk? It's $3.50 divided by the $5. And that gives you a probability of success. It's the old floor trader hack that, um, that we used to use. So that's about as close as you can get with like, you know, it's not perfect. Don't get me wrong. This is not perfect. Like I said, this is a floor trader hack. It's going to be very close. Um, and when we have an early exit, that increases your probabilities dramatically. But, you know, th that is back of the napkin math that uh, can't really be quoted as fact um, at this point anyway. Another Wolfman hack. Yes, definitely use that. It only really works on call spreads, though. You know, I mean, it's not necessarily going, you know, and the other thing is you can do that on long call spreads and put spreads as well. Uh, and you'll see that your probability of success is lower because, you know, if you flip this and said, let's buy this and sell this one. Well, now we're paying a debit of a dollar forty eight. Um we can figure out what our probability of success is there, which is a uh, dollar forty-eight divided by five, right? So divided by five equals we have a twenty-nine percent probability of success. So it works both ways, All right? And that's why I always say like long call spreads, especially the ones where you're starting out of the money, have a very low probability of success. <clears throat> All right. Um, anybody else have any other ones real quick? I've got one more that I can use that I vetted. And this was on the uh, utility or on the utility sector, <laughs> utility side um, that has really high implied volatility right now. So utilities are getting beat up. And this is a ETF for the utility sector. And it's a 71 percent IV so uh, or 71 IV percent I should say that correctly uh, as you can see here it has it's up near the highs for sure it's gone almost straight down it doesn't look like there's any stop I don't always like to do it when it gets a little overextended to the downside but it could easily want to come down uh, and test these areas here so you know just a not necessarily that I would even short Costco as a as a trade or uh, the utilities when they get a little overextended, I'd like to see a little bit more of a bounce before I would implement this, but it does fit all of the other rules besides my assumption necessarily. Um, so we can look at this, start to look for that 36 Delta. It's right here, 51. Uh, so we would look to sell, uh, let's just look at it as a dollar wide right now to see if it fits the rules. Um, and it does 30 cents. One thing I'd, should probably go through my steps first, picking the right underlying XLU. It's an ETF. Uh, does it have the correct width? Less than it's a under hundred dollar stock. So it should be 10 cents wide. We've got five cents wide here, uh, four cents wide there. So that fits the rule just outside the money on the 35 days to expiration, which is our uh, right time or our right duration, right? And then picking the right strikes. We're looking at a 36 Delta. That's pretty darn close. One dollar wide, thirty cent credit. Okay, so a thirty cent credit means that fits that between thirty three percent to twenty five percent the width of the underlying. Uh, what is our 
uh, probability of success, well, you just take the 70 cents, 71 cents, in this case, 71 cents divided by $1, and you probably can do that in your head, 71%. Okay? So that fits the rule. We got a 70% probability of success. You know, not, not the best, but it's not terrible either. And if we had a bearish market assumption that we thought it was going to continue to go down, that would be uh, fitting all of those rules as well. And then we would try to look. One of the problems with this, this is where I was talking about the commissions, especially with the lower price stocks, is, you know, a lot of you guys will say, well, 15 cents is not a lot to collect, uh, you know, to get out, especially if you're paying a few dollars in commissions on both sides. This would probably be one of those cases I would try and stretch that out to, you know, like 70 percent of max profit on this. So, you know, we'd be looking to get out at um, what is that on math wise? So times point set. Uh, so 20. So get out when it's trading around 20 cents or uh, sorry, nine cents, I should say. So about a 20 percent, 20 cent decrease would be where I'd be looking to get out. Uh, repeat the probability of success, yes. Somebody's asking to repeat the formula for probability of success on just, that really only works on the call spreads, to be quite honest. Or uh, on the spreads, I should say, call spreads, put spreads. Um, on the butterflies, I'll have to dig into that a little bit further right now. Um, or uh, in the future, I will look into that a little bit more. All right, so probability of success. So what we do is we take what our risk is and divide it by the width of the spreads and the width, okay? So, you know, our total real risk is $1. You know, that is, you know, a one way, one way to look at it. Our total risk is $1, but we collected this 29 cents. So that's ours to keep. So that's kind of out of the equation. So our real risk is only 70 cents. So you take what your risk is and divide it by the full width. And in this case, our real risk is only 71 cents. So you take uh, 71 cents and divide it by uh, the $1 wide, okay, which gives us 71%, right? Now, on something like that last one, we were, we were looking at uh, Costco, or was it Costco? Um, I think it was Costco we were looking at, where it was $1.50 wide on a $5 wide. So let's just go back and make sure. I think it was Costco, wasn't it? Um, Costco, let's check it out. Costco. So closest to the 36 Delta. So we sold this one, buy this one. Our $1.47 credit. It's a $5 wide, right? So our total risk is $5, but our real risk, because we got to collect this $1.47 that we get to keep, our real risk is only $3.53, right? Uh, what is cost? Costco. Cost is Costco. Is that what your question was, SB? So, um, three dollars and fifty three cents is our risk. Three dollars and fifty three cents divide it by the total width of the spread, which is five dollars, which gives us a seventy and a half percent probability of success. All right. That's your little floor trader hack. Oh, everybody's blowing me up on this one now. Uh, if the position goes against you, and at what point do you close a position to limit the loss, i.e. 50% of the premium received? Uh, okay, so Gary, this is really going to, this is a touch and go kind of thing. You know, I mean, uh, I have a buddy that has like even a time stop on this stuff where he will get out, you know, if this doesn't start moving in his direction in five days or something like that, you know, uh, it's more along the lines of the debit spreads, but he does do a lot of time stops. Like if it starts, if it doesn't start working out in you know five days, I'm out of it. I don't care what it is, you know, and that's just his risk parameter, right? For me, I have a tendency to 
with defined risk strategies like this, I will play it out for the probabilities, all right? Um, the early exit, like I said, increases your probabilities of success. Uh, I will let this play out, but that's me. I have a high problem or I have a high risk tolerance. You could say that if uh, this goes to $3, uh, you're out like two times the credit received in a sense. I don't have any problem with that. Um, and that would not be allowing this to go very far against you at all. But I would be leaning on the uh, 200s to uh, let that defined risk go against me. But that's me. I have a higher risk tolerance than most people. But yes, I would not have a problem with saying, hey, this credit balloons up to three dollars. You're out. Then then do that. That's that's not. But be consistent with it also. Right. Uh, if that's what you want. All right. Uh, can open interest and volume be used as a guideline uh, to place these trades? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, well, it, it can be a. I guess I don't. I guess I was thinking something different. Uh, are you saying where you see like a lot of open interest or you know um, unusual option activity like the Nigerian the Nigerians kind of look at? Uh, yes, you could definitely. I mean, if that. If it lined up with it, if you saw unusual option activity, you could do something like that. Um, but keep in mind, the further out you go, there's usually less volume. So, you know, in this case, you know, there's more open interest right here at these. But that's basically because that's very close to where uh, the underlying is trading. That's usually where you see most of that happen. Does that answer your question? Costco is in a bull market. Uh, why would we do short call spreads? Uh, usually do short put spreads. Hey, that exactly what I was saying. I'm not probably going to implement this, but it fits all the other rules. If you had a bearish assumption here, right? I'm not saying I have a bearish assumption. And why would you when uh, Sam's Club just said they're closing down? That's good for Costco. I think Costco is going to go higher. I've talked about this in daily market commentaries. I started, uh, I've been trading Costco to the upside as well because our Costco, and I've talked to other people since, uh, it was the first time I had seen self checkouts at Costco. That's brilliant because I'm not that guy that goes to Costco and likes to fill up a full cart, one of those monster, you know, 18 wheeler carts that they have there. I usually go there and buy like, maybe five things and, it, and it's a deterrent for me to have to go in there and buy five things when I got to stand in line for 30 minutes, right? I'm not going to shop there as often, but now that I know that they have self checkouts and I can get in and out of there faster than I can get in and out of the grocery now at, at some points, you know, like uh, I love it because my grocery, my grocery around the corner doesn't even have self checkouts or the, you know, 15 items or less aisle ever open. So I can literally go to Costco, get it in and out there faster than I can get it out of a regular grocery store. That's huge to me. That's going to increase my visits. That's ultimately going to increase Costco's bottom line because I'm spending more money there than I am elsewhere because I can get in and out. So to me, I'm, I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not bearish Costco. So, uh, I probably won't be implementing this anytime soon um, on the short side. But it, you know, it's as an example of it fitting all the rules. If you had a, a neutral to bearish market assumption, one could actually say, you know, Costco has been pretty neutral. So um, it might work. Uh, I think Costco is working on a triple top. Uh, it will be interesting to see the 192 level. Hey, that's the triple top being here. One, two, three. I mean, yeah, one could say that this does feel very toppy. But um, I don't know. And it doesn't have earnings. That was another reason why we kind of went with it. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we can come up with all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, we could even look at Fibonacci levels if I have the right chart set up here. Fibonacci's, you know, I mean, um, it's been stuck in that area. So, you know, one could say that, well, uh, I think it's, it's going to have a tough time getting through here. It's kind of building up right here. It's going to be back and forth until those earnings, um, you know, that would be a neutral assumption, right? So that would work as well. I would feel like uh, somebody mentioned more comfortable probably selling a put spread here for that neutral assumption. But, um, but you know, it, it, to each his own, right? And that I'm not saying that that it, this is the right trade. I'm just saying that it is the right environment and everything else. If you had a bearish to neutral assumption in Costco, it would work. I would be more probably inclined to do that XLU trade to the downside, even though, you know, uh, it seems like it's a little overdone to the downside, but, you know, it is in a very bearish market. And who wants to invest in utilities when we just got tax breaks and all these other companies are sexier and are, uh, have potential to um, do much better than the utility sector? Uh, can you explain the blue uh, curve to the right? Oh, upper corner. This, all of this, this is called monkey bars and market profile. And we used to call it Stottlemyre on the floor. And, you know, this was what I always looked at on the floor as the uh, psychology of the market. It's really where people are putting their money where their mouth is. This is where the most time and volumes you know, this is actually where the most time and volume has been spent. This is where the uh, market has found value. It's not to say the market can't find value at different levels uh, when it starts building those up. But what happens is when the market gets overextended to one side or the other of these volume nodes, uh, then it wants to come back there because that's where everybody's happy. When people aren't making money and people aren't losing money in the market, that's usually where they're the happiest. When I'm talking the overall market is the happiest, right? When I'm no longer losing money, if I was losing money on a trade and it came back down to maybe where I got in and, you know, everybody's happy there, you're, you're complacent. When, when you're making a lot of money, you really aren't complacent, right? Like you're pulling your hair out whether or not you should be getting out of that trade. So um, all of those things drive it back down to, uh, where the volume nodes are is what that is. It really gives me a great indication on a chart as to what the psychology of the market is, because where you see the trades happening is where people are finding value. That makes sense. And uh, fee the I have a whole uh, webinar on how to trade this. So on on a daily like thirty minute segment all the way to uh, long-term as well, that you can check it out. Uh, volume versus, yeah, volume at what price? So this is, you know, like right here, there there was a lot of trade right here at around the 157.7 uh, dollars per share. That's where the most volume has basically been traded. Actually, it's right here, uh, 159. It looks like it's there, but it's saying it's telling me it's right here. So right here, 159, 160 is where the most money has exchanged hand and where it has spent the most time. So usually a lot when it's spending a lot of time there, there's a lot of transactions as well. So they kind of have a tendency to line up with each other. Uh, how do I use, I explain it, how to use it in the uh, webinar? I don't really have enough time to go over all of those details, but check that out. Reach out to us and. Uh, get that sent off to you. But, you know, I trade it when it gets overextended that it wants to come back to those areas. Okay. It's hard to find, it's hard to find bearish stocks in this market. It's it, a, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? It is very hard. And I thought I found a couple in the past couple of weeks and they have not been working out very well either. So, you know, uh, it's better to be probably be selling puts right now, but then that's when it cracks, right? <laughs> All right, guys, this is the, uh, the deal for today. 
And in the chat window, if you check it out in that chat window over there, I'm uh, sending you guys a link for this so you don't have to write it down. But if you're watching it on tape delay or whatever, or watching this tomorrow morning, when you get it sent to you, you can just pause this and type this all out into your URL. Make sure you type it exactly, otherwise it doesn't go through. But it's two months for the price of one for 79 bucks, you guys. This is a great deal. You get everything. Uh, you get the Wolfman daily market commentary videos. That's where I talk about every single trade I put on, uh, how I'm managing my risk, when the trades are going against me, what you know, what's going through my mind, how am I dealing with that adversity, and how do I manage that risk? You know, if I have on like a, a strangle, what am I doing to stay mechanical with these trades in order to increase my probabilities of success. I go through that. I'm not cherry picking trades. I don't go there and tell you, hey, if you would have bought this or if you would have sold this call spread in, you know, X, Y, Z on, you know, this date and gotten out of it today, you would have had a profit of. No, I don't do that. I tell you today I put this trade on. I even will even narrow it down to on the charts when I put it on. And when I take it off or when I'm thinking of taking it off, if I'm just if I start putting in orders because I'm getting close to my profit target, then I, I'll tell you guys, hey, you know, this is getting close. I'm about a nickel away on this. I've got an order in there. I'm waiting for it to get hit. Stuff like that. I also talk about the economic stuff. I talk about all of the uh, economic data that comes out, how that should affect the overall market or, you know, uh, even with the bonds, you know, with the increasing interest rates, how bonds should be seeing more downward pressure um, and all of those things. I talk about all of the levers and pulleys in the market that, that I see, all my trades that I put on, when I take them off and during earnings, which ones I'm going to be looking at. So uh, check that out as well because we're coming into earnings season. So I'm going to be doing a lot of talking about that. So great deal there. You also have access to... It's probably, I think, over 100 online trading workshops and uh, access to the lessons videos. All right. Those are in the archives. These lesson videos are a little bit quicker ones and top options trading video archives. So all kinds of videos in there. There's hundreds of videos that you guys will have access to uh, through this premium membership offer. So and uh, one thing it doesn't mention here is. You get access to me, you guys. If you take advantage of this, if you have a question, uh, if you have any questions whatsoever on a trade, if it's gone against you, what I can tell you what I would do. If uh, you're like, hey, you know, uh, this this strangler, this iron condor is is going against me. You know, how should I uh, manage this risk? I, can't say what I think you should do, but I can tell you how I would approach the situation. And if I can't do it in an email, I will reach out to you by the phone because believe me, I would rather talk to you on the phone than type, you know, five pages of uh, or five paragraphs in an email, uh, to be quite honest. So you have unlimited access to me on that. So take advantage of that. That's a really good one. Uh, that's not really mentioned here. OK, so. Uh, you know, if you've learned anything at all from me today in these webinars, uh, any nugget at all, it's worth that, taking advantage of just to even get that. So I all my webinars, you guys, I teach or I tout, I should say, probabilities of success and how to increase those probabilities. So just knowing charts and things of that nature isn't always going to make you successful. So. Uh, trading with options, I try and talk about the probabilities of success and how to increase uh, your uh, likelihood of success going forward. All right. So that's about all I got for you guys. Other than I want to thank you guys all for participating in this. Uh, this also has the link here that you would need to pause. It's not a hyperlink or anything like that. But in later webinars, I'm going to be drilling down on option components, how I trade options, when and where I find them appropriate. Also, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at 310-598-6677 or email us at trading at protraderstrategies.com. And Fee, if you wanted to uh, reach out to us, give us a call. Uh, they can tell you exactly where that video is on how to trade that market profile. But for now, uh, you can easily click on this link right there in the chat window. So what do you say, guys? Go ahead and take advantage of that. And if you can't take that, 
Take it easy. Take care, everybody. Uh, is access to the online videos lifetime uh, or only for the two month period? Uh, these, with this setup here, if you buy the certain course, you get access to those forever. But with this one, uh, you get access to them for the premium membership trial. Cool. All right, guys. Have a great weekend. Have a great extended weekend. If you can't take that, take it easy. Thank you, SB. Appreciate the kind words. Thanks, Farshid. Have a good one, guys.